Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Alex, and uh, we're hoping that this is actually going to, um, <laughs> this will actually work this time. Uh, uh, we are, um, yeah, we're on Zoom. <laughs> we're on, on YouTube. So if you're wondering why I'm kind of fumbling through this is that we were having some trouble with the linkage, but it seems to be working now. Um, so anyway, so um, welcome here. Welcome to a Monday morning. And I'm going to hand this off to uh, Liberty White for the hosting duties. Uh, Liberty, take it away. Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. As you know, this show is driven by your questions. So go ahead and add them to Mukana so that our panelists can do our best <laughs> for this brain trust to answer them. Let's go, Bill. All right. Our first question this morning comes from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. And Paul says, any suggestions on how to elegantly and effortlessly inject audio and video clips into a podcast on the fly? Noah? Yeah, so you're ultimately um, introducing playback in your system, right? So even if it's just for podcasting, um, you have to have some sort of playback device, and then you have to get that into your signal chain, right? Um, so you can do that via a computer and making sure that comes out to your recorder. Um, you can do that in post-production when you're editing that podcast. But the, the main thing I would focus on is making sure the levels are normalized so that you don't have one loud clip, one quiet clip, and that you also, you know, trim the heads and tails or whatever. So you play just what you need um, for that. Jesse? We do all of our audio and video cues live when we're podcasting. And for software, I recommend Farago by Rogue Amoeba. Uh, for audio, uh, Farago is great. And for video, you really can't beat... Um, Keynote. Keynote is such a fantastic piece of software for that. And Alex. Yeah, and, and unless you have a very large live audience or there's a reason for it, I have to admit that I would probably add most sound effects later um, as opposed to during the show. I, I, I know it kind of gets it all in one package, but you don't have a lot of room to, to, uh, for error. So I think that would be the only thing that I would consider unless there's some live element that would um, really push you down that path. Next question. Next one comes from uh, Anthony Saranina from Diamond Bar, California. And he says, I'm so excited to have come across Office Hours. Can you recommend the best way for a newbie such as myself to this group, uh, how to get involved on Office Hours projects? Well, first, welcome, Anthony and Rupert. Indeed, uh, welcome. So you're certainly on the right track, which is to have joined along here and uh, to be in the uh, in the Q&A and to be submitting questions. It's, um, it's a sort of first, uh, one of the first steps of getting in, getting involved. If you're in there and uh, in the Makana chat, you may at the right time find the uh, Discord link and there might be a good, uh, it will be a, definitely a good uh, pathway to get involved in some of those projects. Most of the kind of spin-off projects are discussed in uh, Discord to some extent, either by dedicated channels, you know, in there. And so you'll be able to see the discussion, join the discussion there about those projects. And a lot of them, Again, the projects are um, in some of the YouTube uh, videos that are there in the um, kind of back catalog. So orientate yourself with uh, some of that, some of the recent progress. And then when you um, join in that conversation, maybe in Discord, you'll have some context uh, around how to get involved. Also check out the uh, form on the officehours.global website there to, to fill in there and say what uh, you may like to have to offer or where you'd like to get involved. Alex? Yeah, and definitely, depending on what your skill set is, if you have if you have some experience and you'd like to share it, uh, we definitely you know this is a good time to uh, jump on the panel uh, if you if you if if you're up for that. Um, but also, uh, after hours is a great when you see those behind the scenes things coming up when we're doing a um, a lot of times in after hours, whether it's the mobile process or the Belfast method or other. Um, things that people are putting together and even office hours 2.0 as we kind of move forward watching the behind the scenes will be really useful because you'll get a sense of who's doing what and where you might be able to fit in and those types of things as well so but uh, and i would also i leave after hours on kind of like radio as much as i possibly can listening to it will let you get used to the community and let you get used to who's doing what and how they're doing it and so um, i'd highly recommend jumping into after hours the link is in the email that goes out and uh, right, hidden at the bottom. No, not so hidden because I just told you. But at the bottom, you can get into after hours. And from there, you can, um, you know, at least uh, be part of that conversation that happens all day. Awesome. Next question. Next one comes to us from Hashid in Central Florida. And he says, recently heard about potato and other names thrown out. What is a, use, a, what is a useful product to have for Windows users? And he's looking for virtual potatoes, VB meter, et cetera. Wire is a link to support. And he's got the voice meter suite of software links there. Jeffrey? 
Yeah, voice meter is a uh, uh, turns uh, a Windows machine into its own virtual mixer. Uh, so uh, they have different versions. Potatoes, the bigger one. Uh, bananas, uh, they have voice meter, which is like a two or three channel. And then you have uh, banana, which is a four channel and gives you effects. You can bring in third party uh, uh, programs to bring in side chains like WLM meters or anything like that. And then, of course, potatoes, the bigger one, uh, which gives you, I think it's like six or eight channels in there. The best thing to do is to actually have hardware in between uh, before you even bring it in the computer. But if you can't do that, I have never heard of any other software that does what uh, Voice Meter does for Windows. And uh, so if anybody has anything on that, uh, I'd love to love to hear it. Next question. Next one comes to us from Tobias Moss in Minneapolis. He says, I watched the figure skating championships yesterday. How do they capture the skate noise? Alex? Yeah, so a lot of that, I mean, I haven't done the skate skating, but we've done a lot of those kinds of events. And oftentimes there's as many as 20, 25 mics pointed at the, at, actually at the surface that they're playing on. So for instance, I know that we had, I think when, when we were getting stems from a basketball game, a professional basketball game, I think we were getting like 26 stems from the, from the, uh, just from the floor. So all the, you know, so basically those are shotgun mics. And if you look carefully, a lot of times you'll see them hidden in a lot of different places in basketball, they're mostly hidden behind the, um, you know, when, when they're shooting behind the backboard, you'll see a whole bunch of gear that's all kind of hidden down there and there's little shotgun mics pointed down and then they're, they're kind of all hidden in little places. And if you look for them, you'll, you'll see shotguns, but those are typically what we've seen. Um, people using for for that type of sound. Tobias. Yeah. Um, in that, do they uh, do they? Is there someone chasing the the action, or do they just have enough coverage? Typically not. I mean, there there may be a person doing that. Every you know, there's there's one or two people that are tracking, and you'll sometimes see those folks because usually if they're tracking at a distance, they're using parabolic, which is we had the folks that make those <laughs> on mm -hmm. on uh, office hours, and so they're using parabolics because the, otherwise you're not going to really get a lot of usable stuff. Most of the ambient that's that's grabbed is generally, um, from my experience, is generally mics that are there, and then they're mixing those mics in and out. And the, mm -hmm. and then a, a, if I can follow up. Um, a friend here runs a ice dance company. And so I was curious if there was any um, other way to go about it, like would a lavalier on a boot work um, without having to set up, you know, that full coverage? It could, it just changes the trim for the, uh, for the actual skater. So adding additional things like, so for instance, the, you know, when you're looking at a football game and you're hearing the, the quarterback call, you know, blue 45, blue 45, those are little microphones that are in, uh, the guards <laughs> in their in their shoulder pads and it is an enormous amount of work is done to make sure that that it is completely seamless to them um that that it's not there it's very very small transmitters and and very you know hidden in the crevices of things with a skater they just have a lot less room they don't have shoulder pads <laughs> so finding a place to put a transmitter and a um and a lavalier in a way that wouldn't affect their ability to skate would be difficult and would you say that they've had rehearsals as well so that they know where, like just from a placement perspective? Oh, I mean, yeah, you could. I mean, you could probably take a shotgun and point it at some, or you could take a parabolic and, and point it at somebody skating and get something out of it. I mean, I think that, and, and that would probably be, you know, if you're doing it, if you're trying to just do it and you don't have a big crowd and the problem is lots of people moving around creates just more, you know, it just creates a lot of error, places for error. If you're trying to create an actual, are they trying to create a video or are they trying to create, what are they, what are they trying to create with it? Um, for a live performance to have the skating sound amplified so that it cuts over the music or with the music. Oh. In person, just for in person live. But that means the music's in, in the, in the field as well, right? Yes. Yeah. That would be very difficult because you'd That's have to turn it up. That's a problem. Yeah. Because you're now pulling in, that would be difficult. That would be super hard chris yeah I, I used to do live sports in another life 30 30 plus years ago and nobody works harder in sports television than the audio team they are putting mics all over the place when it comes to skating one of the things that you're going to see is you know like people skating past a, a, a camera you know big canon zoom lens whatever and quite often they just have shotguns on top of the lenses. 
uh, the audio um, can run back to the truck through the through the camera feed. Um, basketball was always a great one. That the, they'll put little lavaliers underneath in the rubber around the um, the the backboard, like right at the net. So when the when the ball goes through the net, you know. And uh, the other one is the baseball bat crack. There's always a shotgun or two at pointing at home base. And I've and I've sat in the trucks with audio guys, and they're literally sitting. There's one guy I remember; he was sitting there reading the newspaper, and instinctively he knew right when to pot up the the shotguns for the bat, the bat crack. But he was totally reading the paper; he was barely paying attention to the game. But um, shotguns on the cameras, I will say for what you're saying, Tobias, amplifying it in a room, it's a feedback nightmare. I would say, hard no go. I don't think that's even possible. Noah? I was just curious what they would call, would that be like an ambient mic technician or like a mixer? Or how would you describe that department slash person? In, in all the sports I've always seen, it's the, it's the A1. He's, he's controlling the show. And he's got a you know big, big desk in front of him. He ranges it any way he wants, but he, he knows what he's doing. He's following the action. Alex? His job. Yeah, a lot of time in the in the games that we've worked on, the, the the house delivers both the stems as well as the as a mix. So they'll do their own mix for it. Um, and if you want to take that, you can. Otherwise, those stems are delivered to the broadcast truck as well, um, and so that they they can make, build their own mix from it. But yeah, yeah. The, the big problem is is they're recording it or they're broadcasting it. They're not pushing it back into the speak back into the speakers. That's the thing that's the that makes things um, you know super complicated. Um, and yeah. So that, that would be the thing that, that I'd be worried about. I think you might be better off with, I bet you that someone watching with a um, tactile sound effect. So like one of the things that happened a lot during um, the football games during COVID was they had people that were, they had all these cheers. So what happened was is that um, EA got Sky Sports to record all these crowd noises so there's tons of crowd noises that were recorded by Sky Sports for, um, for EA's games. When COVID hit, Sky Sports came back to EA and said, you know those recordings that you did, that we did for you, can, can we use those? <laughs> so they, so they, they got those recordings back and they put them into, and they remote fired them during games in the broadcast to make you feel like the crowd was there. So they cheer, or they not cheer, or they do this other things and they add all these sound effects. Yeah, it, it worked pretty well. Um, and I think that you probably, with rehearsal, you could probably have someone, you could probably record the people skating on a, everyone's quiet, record all of it, and have someone literally firing those things off as sound effects. Um, you could probably even do it, you could probably cue that in with the music because they have to hit at a certain point. Of course, there'd be problems if they fell. You still hear, you know, but, um, but for the most part, you could cue it back in, you could cue it live um, or have it, you could have someone overriding it to turn it off if it if they fell or did something different or or whatever and let it otherwise be just a cue. Um, but but I think that that might be I think that would be easier and would sound better than trying to take the actual recordings and push them back into the into the space. All right. Next question. Next one comes to us from Anthony Saranana, it looks like, excuse me, Diamond Bar, California. I wear many hats at a small local city government access station. Would the group have interest to provide input and recommendations with several major projects in 2022 that I'll be tackling, such as full studio and mobile truck designs? Noah? I definitely would be interested to hear what you do. That's side of uh, the creative juices, like always are great to see what people do and how they build it out. Um, there's after hours where you can kind of just ask people who are hanging out um, what they think, but um, I would definitely encourage you to post in the Discord uh, pictures and concepts of what you have, because um, there's definitely several people building out um, studios and different things. Um, I would also look at the episodes around build outs. Um, Alex is currently building um, his stage and I'm sure he'll tell you about that now. Alex. All I was going to say is we would love to talk to you about that. <laughs> we, uh, a bunch of us have designed trucks, designed studios, designed those things. Um, I think that it'd be fun. I mean, if you wanted to come on for a second hour, we'd give you a second hour just to sit here and, and brainstorm with you to, uh, 
talk about what you have, um, but you're more than welcome to jump into After Hours and ask us questions. Uh, you can ping me on Discord. Um, no, no, no charge. We're just always interested in what what the uh, what you're. I mean, if we have to start building new drawings, it's a thing. But if for advice, uh, love to talk. I, I always am curious what people are doing, what they're trying to do, and and how we can help. So um, we would love to be involved in what you're doing um, and helping uh, uh, make sure that you have the at least our opinion of the most modern and best solution. Someone with a a budget that gets to play with it is just someone who now has a a sandbox that we'd all like to play in <laughs> and help help you build. So uh, so yeah, definitely uh, ping us. It, it sounds like a great great opportunity. Seen the panel's eyes light up yeah, we when, like, you ask, when you ask. Building so, a truck. Right. What can we do? Yeah, it's great. Next question. Uh, Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas says, the big games today, national championship, Alabama versus Georgia, Crimson Tide versus the Bulldogs. What audio and video technology should we look for tonight? And he has a link to the game at 8 p.m. tonight. Alex. I mean, I think the thing that to look at, I, I don't know what they're going to do I, um, in, in that one specifically, but when you're watching a football game, uh, what you want to look for is like, how are they handling dynamic information in, in presenting that dynamic information? Um, you know, so is it done in 2D? Is it done in 3D? Does it fly in? Um, are they trying, look for, are they trying to track stuff? So if they, if you see it, if you see something trying to track in with a camera move or come in like it's AR, then that might be an unreal um, you know, solution. So you might want to look at what that looks like. And what I look for when I see that is, are there little jaggies along the edges, otherwise called aliasing, which is kind of indicative of, of um, those types of technologies right now. So, um, you know, look, look for those things. Um, but, uh, and then the other things that I just find magical still after all these years of the, you know, the, the level of compositing for all of the stuff they're putting on the field. So where the, where the field goal um, limit is where the first down markers are the you know the all of that stuff it gets better every year you know as far as how they're integrating those graphics um, finally you know the thing I notice a lot watching it is how often do they use the EVS like do you get a replay every play if they do that replay do they draw over the replay if they have that replay do they do they um, have little things appear over top of them um, you know so I think that and I've said this before that uh, in this world I think that that Sunday night football is probably the 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 best <laughs> from a from a um just the best technology available except for maybe the super bowl so um uh, so it's it, you know you can look at that as kind of a high watermark and so when you watch that one you can see what's possible you know in a lot of ways uh, or what's been pushed to the outer envelope and then everything else kind of um goes down from there um so so anyway so it, it, that those are the kind of things that i would look for next question Paul Wallace wants to do a microphone arm comparison. He starts out the Vivo Black height adjustable pneumatic spring microphone counterbalance arm mount, compact mic stand with mounting clamp, and then he has stand MC01 versus, or vis-a-vis, -vis, the OC White limited edition mic uh, Pro Boom Ultima Gen 2. Compare $80 versus $350. Rupert? The, uh, the Vivo one is interesting. I mean, Vivo makes some good stuff. I love all their monitor mounts and things like that. The mic uh, arm that uh, Paul's talking about here it appears to be, I, I haven't used that one specifically, but it appears to be a variation or at least use the same construction as their pneumatic base amount uh, for their monitor mounting systems. Just got a different you know, head on it or attachment to suit a microphone instead of a, a monitor. I do have the monitor equivalent of that uh, mount, that arm, and that's that's has very solid uh, construction. I have even heard of people adapting what would otherwise be a VESA mount, that arm, into a microphone mount, but I don't know whether that's a road you want to go down. But um, in terms of build quality, it's, it's pretty good. I do know that whenever the debate comes up over these uh, two types of mic arm, that the um, Elgato low-profile arm also generally gets uh, discussed, and I think a lot of folks like that one also. Jeffrey? This is the Vivo right here. I'm going to move it so you can kind of see. So what I did, it, it comes with the bar that uh, will normally go up, but what I've done is on this table, I actually brought it down, and then I can bring the undersling even more underneath the table so I can get to things like my stream deck and stuff like that. I can move it around fairly easy. 
Um, the uh, uh, mounting, the only thing that I'd really wish was a better way to tighten up here because every now and then the microphone will swing back and forth. And if you put it onto the table, make sure you have the shock mount because you're definitely going to hear some table noise if you decide to use it that way if you're using any of your dynamic microphones. Alex. Yeah, I think functionally it looks like it's very close um, to to the to this arm. Um, I have the I have the OC white. Um, I, I have to admit that I, I have some monitor stands, and I mean I have the same ones that Rupert has. But I, after buying the monitor stands that I have from Vivo, I probably wouldn't buy anything else from them. Um, you know, so I think that that was. But but I probably maybe I have a different experience. It just felt like the the build quality was not um, something that lasted as long as I'd like it to. So and I I bought you know, like 20 of them. <laughs> so, so I went over, over a couple, over a little bit of time because they were less expensive. And, uh, and so we used them for a lot of stuff and, and they were over time, they were frustrating for me, but we used them pretty hard. So they weren't just sitting in an office. Um, so that might've been part of it. Tony. Yes, I'm using the OC white as well. And this is a, a first time arm for me. I hadn't had an arm before. I'm really enjoying it. Um, I really can't compare it to the other one because, as I said, this is my first time having one, but I love it. Is that the one that you set up um, in, in After Hours? Yes, it is. Okay. The benefits of After Hours. <laughs> Bill? So having been a voiceover guy for about 40 years now, um, there's two use cases that I find myself using mic arms for. Uh, in my voice booths, I generally set them up and I fiddle with them for about a week. And then I never touch them for how many years I use that mic. I literally never move them because the mic is optimally positioned. I will walk into the voice booth, do my voiceover and walk out of the voice booth. So it may sit there in a single position for five, seven, 10 years. Spending for a huge and carefully adjustable mic mount just doesn't make sense to me in those kind of circumstances. Now fast forward to office hours in the last couple of years, I've been in an environment where this is in my office so every day as soon as I finish this show I swing it out of the way I have to move it and adjust it if I need to work with something on the right side behind where my mic is I will readjust its position spending money for a mic that is infinitely adjustable that I am going to adjust every day makes some sense to me now i also use an oc white i use an older one that is spring mounted it has visible springs it does not look as fancy but it's also out of my shots nobody sees it so those are the things i would balance if you're going to be actively using it a lot i would spend a good bit of money and go with these top brands if you're going to stick it up someplace and leave it there and never adjust it i i have would, would have a hard time adjusting uh, I, I would have a, jar, uh, a hard time making sense of spending a tremendous amount of money on that tool. That's me. Okay, next question. Next one comes from Tobias Moss in Minneapolis. And Tobias says, during services, I like to underscore from my guitar while another clergy is reading a prayer. Does this have auto ducking issues in Zoom? Tobias. So just to clarify, this is when we're doing a service exclusively on Zoom, each clergy in their own home on zoom and whether i can start bringing in guitar while someone is speaking or while two people are doing a responsive um and whether that'll have any issues assuming that i already have great audio for the guitar original sound and all that rupert so um you're a good start to obviously be using uh, original sound all that stuff so it sounds like you're in a good place there the the um couple other things you want to bear in mind is everybody else should be muted you know that anybody not speaking should be muted ideally everybody would be on earphones also you know and if you but if you are coming in if you're playing if you're bringing your music in through a separate participant essentially than the person speaking you can also try um putting your audio in through share audio rather than through your microphone feed shared audio into a meeting um, will not be um, susceptible to all the uh, Zoom auto leveling stuff. And it will basically, you can put that in a shared audio into the meeting and act like a, a bed of audio into the um, meeting. So you can experiment with it that way also. Alex? Yeah, what, what Rupert said. <laughs> the shared audio is really, really important. The other thing is, is that people absolutely have to, every any person with the mic opened has to have headphones or you will lose full duplex. 
so that is an automatic. You will not have it. If, if they're not on headphones, that will not work perfectly. You know, it, it, it should work seamlessly. You should be able to actually go from place to place as long as, but they have to have headphones on. If, if, if it sees, if it hears itself, it's going to start doing, it's going to start responding to that process. Lois. So a question to the to the group is, I understood him to say he's going to be playing live as he did for us this morning. And the shared audio only is from coming from your computer. Is that not correct? You, you can um, use loopback to pass it in as a source. So you can use loopback to create a source that is now seen by the shared audio. So that can be your live mic can go through loopback and be sourced sourced into um, that. So normally you wouldn't be able to do it, but with that tool, you would be able to um, re reroute that. And I want to correct, you can turn echo cancellation off, you know, without ha and still get full duplex. So you turn echo cancellation off in the, um, in uh, everybody's settings, if each person turns that off, but now you're in a thing if they start talking, <laughs> like it's, you know, like, so if you want to do anything that's, that's, uh, has fine tuning for audio, everyone's got to have in ear monitors. You know, like that's the, the, I mean, that otherwise I would, I'd probably keep my elbows in on, on that process. Rupert. And this would be um, an ideal candidate to experiment with in after hours. So jump in there and um, pick a moment and uh, play around with it. Good call. Next question. Next one comes from Oliver uh, or Olivier Rouchard in Saigon, Vietnam. I have the possibility to acquire a Blackmagic eGPU for next to nothing. Does anyone have any experience with a 2018 MacBook Pro i7 16 gigabyte with respect to that device? Jason? Uh, yeah, I do. It will help you with very specific things. Um, live production, if you're rendering and outputting, but um, it needs to be set up very specifically to use and go through the, the eGPU. So yeah, it's not useless, but um, Apple's no longer targeting Mac OS to, to actually take full advantage of external GPUs. Jeffrey. Yeah, metals metals becoming a problem when it comes to anything uh, that's uh, that's Nvidia or AMD uh, related. Uh, I've noticed uh, when I was I was at CES, I was using my laptop, my uh, same MacBook Pro, uh, extensively, and I noticed anything that I was rendering was a lot longer than what I was expecting it to be. So uh, uh, if you decide to do that, don't update your machine to the latest version. I think you're going to run into some big problems uh, even using that if you do. Next question. Eric Price in Kansas City is up next. And he says, when, talk, uh, when taking Zoom live to YouTube, Facebook, and so forth, does any additional encoding needed to be done for those platforms? And does it happen in the cloud versus on the local machine? Noah? My understanding is it's completely cloud-based. Um, the reason is because if you have a co-host and you somehow drop out or disconnect, the stream still goes, right? Um, and I think Zoom is designing so that your local computer has very little load. It's very light, so it could be ran universally on multiple types of machines. Alex, yeah, it's absolutely routed from the cloud. So when you're when you are um, when you have it, the event, basically when you say I want to do a live event, you're joining from from you know Zoom's joining that in the cloud, and then streaming it to streaming its view to YouTube. Rupert, if you're if you're using the inbuilt uh, streaming function in Zoom to stream your event to YouTube or whatever, then that is uh, done in the cloud as, as has been said. But there are some, you know, other folks using different workflows out there and um, using other methods to stream a Zoom uh, event into the uh, cloud, whether it be YouTube or anywhere else. And one reason some folks do that is that the inbuilt streaming um, in Zoom to YouTube, for example, is at 720. Um, I believe there's maybe some edge cases now where it's uh, maintaining the 1080 but I, I don't have anything concrete on that so one reason some folks choose to do it uh, using a separate workflow is that they can get the 1080 usually through some kind of local screen scrape and then some other encoder up to youtube for example so if you were doing it that way then yes that would be a um, a local encoding needing some kind of horsepower locally to to do that if you're looking for that you know if you're in 1080p and you're trying to maintain that 1080p into your live stream Next question. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. In an era of chip and product, sh product shortages, what sources have you trusted for purchasing used equipment? And have you ever bought from Reverb.com before? Jesse? 
Oh, if you can navigate the language barrier, buying used equipment in Japan is a dream. Um, the uh, when the Flow Eight was in high demand and unable to get through Sweetwater, it was on Andertons in England and shipped by the end of the week or came by the end of the week. So just looking at some of the specialty companies outside of your country might have what you need. I've only bought um, new from Reverb.com, I believe. Uh, I bought one product from them, but for me, Facebook Marketplace has been key. Um, it's a couple things you want to look for, several pictures, obviously, um, to ask several good questions. And then if you can get a hands-on, that's always good to get the equipment um, in your hands to see what it actually can do. Um, and then typically I have kind of like a sliding scale. So the more expensive it gets, the less I want to buy used, but it just depends. Bill. Yeah, I did a, I, I've never bought anything off Reverb, but I have sold some old vintage gear. Um, I had a set of high-end um, ancient Sony C37 microphones that are highly prized, and I put them on Reverb. And the people that I met, I got a couple of lowball offers at first, but then in general, the people that I met understood what they were buying. They were really good to work with. We spent a lot of time discussing. They were very careful. We ended up uh, making sure that I was shipping them to a full service dealer there so they could check out what they were getting because this was a this was a purchase up in the five six thousand dollar range and i had a really good experience with them so there are people on reverb who are higher end folks who do a really good job that's been my experience next question next one comes to us from hashid in central florida and Hashid says has the panel heard of camo an app based on making your phone a, vi a viable webcam specifically for the needs for pc and android Android users. I suppose it's similar to Iron, good alternative to a laptop cam. John? This is interesting. I just spent the last 10 minutes trying to bring up camo and show you, but my phone won't connect to it anymore. I, I ran it last year. It ran fantastic. It's got great controls because you can select any of the cameras on the phone, but from right now it's not connecting. I don't know if it's not compatible with, uh, with the new OS or not. We'll see. I'm troubleshooting. Okay, keep us posted, Tony. So, if it's an i, it's, if it's a f smartphone application to use with a computer, I have purchased it. I have purchased all of them. I have tried all of them, and I have come to the conclusion that Filmic Pro is the best way to go. And there is a version of Filmic Pro that works on some Androids. It, uh, usually high-end Android phones works well with Filmic. Jeffrey. So this is the problem that I have with, uh, with that, and that's this. If you, uh, if you lose any type of connection with your, uh, with your desktop to your uh, phone, you have absolutely no control of your camera. So if that comes right back in, you might have, it, it might reset everything, and then all of a sudden you have to go just run to try and get this uh, to back to the settings that you're looking for. It's, a, it's an okay app, but yeah, Filmic Pro is where I, I would go with this. Next question. Next one comes to us from Brian Callahan in Mountain View, California. And Brian says, any recommendations for a Bluetooth audio mixer? No need for production quality, not recording anything. He has two computers that put out audio via Bluetooth and would like to mix audio channels together for his Bluetooth Bose headphones. Jason. All right. Um, if you're going to be using anything with side tone, which your use case does not indicate, then... Um, you're going to run into problems with Bluetooth headphones. I have, to, I have to start by saying that. You can get a cheap analog mixer, mixer and add an Airfly Plus, uh, Pro from 12 South, or um, the Flow 8, I believe, can do this natively, and it's inexpensive and um, seems to be pretty well-liked on the panel. Rupert? If the two computers are nearby one another, I think what I would do if I you know, absolutely wanted to use those Bluetooth headphones would just get those... Bluetooth uh, headphones paired reliably to one computer and then uh, cross-link the computers with like an analog connection and monitor the input, um, the output of one computer into an input on the other computer and then monitor that through, through a headphones attached to a single computer. Next question. Next one comes to us from Tony Mobley in Newton, Georgia. What's the best tool for use uh, for the opening credit video for Houses of Worship? Tony? 
Yeah, I need some help. I'm a 911, help, help, help. What's going on is that we have been opening services um, for Houses of Worship with a PowerPoint. And then there's copyrighted music that plays. And then we do a slide with the church's information and that kind of thing. I want to move away from that completely. I want to have some type of a video that talks about the church and the information that we are doing on the slideshow. I want to move away from the slideshow. So I, I don't have, I don't, I don't know how to do it. And so I'm asking for help. Alex. And, and do you have a way to play it back? Or do you want to, are you trying to figure out what was going to, there's, there's two parts of this, of course, is one is creating the video itself. And the second is playing it out. So do you know how you're going to play the video out? Are you going to use something like play out B or, you know, to, to, to play the video before the show? I could, I could use a uh, play out B. I do have X, I do have a Raspberry Pi that works yeah. and I could, I could use that. Um, and um, I'm looking for suggestions. Um, because I, I, I got to move away from what the way we're doing it. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, you could probably do most of it. We were talking about this on Saturday. You could probably do most of it in, in keynote, um, as far as like putting together videos, cause keynote will then export as a video. So you can build everything you want in keynote and then in PowerPoint, we'll do this as well. But, um, on, if, since you're on a Mac, I would say that a, key, a keynote is probably going to give you a better solution, but you can put your videos in, you can have all those bits and pieces and you can say, record it. When you do export, you export as a video and you can export out as an H.264 loaded into PlayOutB and you're good to go. So I think that you may find that, you know, if you need to do finer editing, iMovie is probably the first thing that you, you'd, you'd have available to you that you could cut a little video together if you want to. Um, from there, you could move to, you know, again, in the le less expensive solution and less complicated solution, something like Motion or Final Cut to, th to put little little bits and pieces into it if you if you can't do it in, in iMovie. Um, obviously, uh, LumaTouch is another option on the iPad as far as being able to shoot them things, some stuff and edit it together. And I would say that just depending on user experience that something like Canva, even though it started out as a graphic design platform or tool, um, it's, it's a website that you can create flyers, but now you can also do videos as well. And they have a lot of templates there that you can drag and drop. Now, Keynote would be the better option. However, if it's a matter of speed and just still trying to figure out your way around software, I would recommend just testing out at Canva. That's something that can be used. And Tobias? I'm curious whether this is like a permanent trailer video or something that you'd want to update week to week with information for the coming week and what have you, in which case you'll really want the workflow to be as easy as making a new slide. Otherwise, you'll get stuck with 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 not making it adjusted week by week. No, yeah, it, it, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. No, that I was, was going to say that is it, I want a, a I guess a branding video so that this is the way it will start going forward particularly on youtube this is you know how the, the the house of worship is represented and that part would not change week to week it would be like their the brand video thanks tony uh to buy it i'm mean, sorry noah yeah so we do something similar um at the house of worship i'm at so we pre-produce a video we have a countdown and then a welcome video um and then we go into worship so Pro Presenter is the absolute best tool, um, in my opinion, for this because you could play videos, you could do lower thirds for slides, um, you could do multiple things. I know it's like I think four hundred bucks uh, for the first year, but um, hands down, at all, all the house of worships I've been a part of, that's been the the key tool for sure. Next question. Next one comes from John Snyder in Reno, Nevada. He says, what's the best way to identify the appropriate lens based on a subject's distance from camera? He received a micro four thirds camera from, for Christmas and the 25 millimeter lens is too close. Alex? For the most part, as a rule of thumb, you want to approximate the equivalent of a 50 millimeter lens. Um, you know, so that's really where, that's what feels normal for me. So like for, for people to, to look at because 50 millimeter kind of approximates the human vision. So you have, I mean, that's a massive generalization of <laughs> how that works, but, but, but it is the, the, it's the, it's the place where we feel like it's the closest to what we're used to looking at. Um, I'm at about a 35 on a, on a, 
and, and, and that would be the focal length that is the true focal length for, for that lens to that sensor. So I have a super 35 set at 30 at, um, 35 millimeters that from a camera that's or a lens designed for full frame. So that's equipped very close to the equivalent of 50 millimeters. Um, so that's what you're trying to approximate the equivalent of 50 millimeters. You can go longer or wider. It's not, as you go wider, you'll look more distorted. Um, you can actually go longer for a long way. It just gets harder to deal with because <laughs> the camera keeps on moving away. But we've shot stuff with people that, you know, the camera's 25 feet away on, on a long zoom because it made our green screen actually need to be less. <laughs> so, so going longer is usually less problematic um, for a single person talking, but going shorter uh, tends to distort their face. Bill. I'm 100% going to support everything Alex said. I try to get them at about 50 millimeters as a starting place. Uh, just also understand that there are all sorts of different kinds of lenses. And if you're using a micro four thirds camera and you're putting, uh, you've got two choices. You can buy micro four thirds lenses, in which case you're looking for a 50 millimeter, possibly an 85 if you want them to be closer, if your camera has to be far away or a 75 or something like that. But generally speaking, uh, also pay attention to the fact that if you go out there in the lens market and you find full frame lenses, that crop factor is going to push in substantially on that. So it's 50, I think, is an excellent target. I'm just going to agree with Alex there. And Noah. So your lens projects light onto the sensor ultimately, right? And so um, the lens needs to fit the sensor size or else you have a crop factor or a differentiating factor. So there are there are online calculators to help you determine what a full frame lens would look like on the four thirds, which is kind of what Bill and Alex were talking about. So um, figure out where you are um, with your lens to sensor and if there's a crop factor or what have you, use those online tools to calculate that out. It sounds like for your specific situation in um, your room, you may not get to that 50 mil, um, which is what the human vision, you know, um, is ideal. So you might have to go wider. So for me, um, I think on a micro four thirds, um, I've gone as low as 14 mil to try to get that shot for the drummer at our, our church that has worked. So you'll just have to experiment, unfortunately, and do some calculations. Next question. Guy Cochran's up next from Seattle, Washington. What's a good app to measure or benchmark computers? Jeffrey. So on the PC side, I use FutureMark because FutureMark has uh, several different programs that you can use, including 3D Mark, VR Mark, and PC Mark, uh, depending on what you're what you're really benchmarking there. On the Mac side, I use Geekbench. Uh, I think they're at Geekbench five right now, and a couple other tools that I use is the Blackmagic Disk Speed Test, and the uh, on the PC side, the OWC DiscAware uh, to kind of clean up the uh, clean up my hard drives. Rupert. I think the most uh, useful tests are real world examples. You know, a lot of those benchmarking tools are synthetic, synthetic tests and don't necessarily, you know, tell you how something is going to perform when you actually do a real piece of work. So if you have prepackaged examples of things that you do, like a known a, a file that you regularly work with, you know, or that you need to render out uh, or a, a file or a file that represents a use case that you're going to, you know, put that machine to, to te actually test the real world example, time it or measure it that way, then you're getting an actual representation of the actual work that you're likely to do. Alex? Yeah, the one that we use probably the most is Cinebench, um, is the one that we kind of went in doubt when we don't have a real world, exp exp you know, it does, as, as stated before, the best thing to do is do what you're going to do <laughs> and, and see and render, I'm going to render this, or I'm going to do this thing and, and do something that you can quantify. But when we don't know, we usually, Cinebench is usually what we depend on. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next and he says, what's the most common platform for virtual sets, Unreal Engine or Unity? And he, in, in parentheses adds, could Unity work? Alex? Unity is good for a lot of things. Uh, virtual sets is not one of them. Um, they chose not to uh, figure, they chose not to calculate for 29.97 instead of 30, which makes them very hard to integrate. It's why everybody uses Unreal for that. <laughs> so um, so the, the, it's a, so Unity, is very competitive with Unreal when it comes to doing AR, comes to doing things on a computer, comes to doing things in a virtual only platform. But when integrating with um, with broadcast that needs a, needs a drop frame uh, or needs the 2997 or 5994, um, Unity is not, the engine for that is not there. Um, and it took a lot for Unreal to get that to work. And so that's, it would take them a lot. And I think that they're just, I think, 
I don't know anything, but I, my guess is they just made the decision that that wasn't the future they were looking for. Next question. Dave Odin in Johnstown, Colorado says, what's the normal number of monitors needed for a video production room and what should be showing on those monitors, six cameras and one computer feed? <laughs> Do we have the symbol for infinity here? Right. <laughs> Noah? It really depends. Um, how many can you fit on that wall? No, I'm just kidding. But it really depends on the size of the room and your budget, obviously. Um, if you look at broadcast trucks, they cover the walls with monitors. Um, in my humble opinion, you really only need one that has a multi-view, right? And that one monitor could have all of those um, on that single screen. Alex? Yeah, let me give you, show you a couple examples at least. Um, this is uh, this is actually a truck. <laughs> so uh, what you have up here are the are, uh, extended multi views. Um, this is on a this is in a fifty four foot double expando, I think. And so these are um, multi views that are all the feeds coming in. This is a another multi. These are more multi views. These are all individual monitors here to, that are showing full resolution, I believe. Um, then you have program and preview for the and the director sitting here while the TD is actually running the building the show out. Um, this is in a broadcast center, and so you're, you're more of a master control. And you'll see, as as Bill said, there's no there's no limit to the number of monitors that you can or you, you may want. Um, and again, what you're looking at generally is lots and lots and lots of multi views, you know, so that you can see as many sources as possible. And and with each person, they'll they'll be able to route these so that they can see them. You'll see some decisions here, like you'll notice this monitor is different than the other ones. That's because this person here is a is doing the shading for the cameras. So this is a shading um, space, so they have to have a color accurate monitor um, to take a look at what they're actually doing there. Um, this is one that we actually built. Um, so this is a much more austere, you'll see there's again our little uh, color accurate monitor. Um, multi views across here on 55 inches, and then these are all like 20, 27 inch uh, Dells or whatever. Um, and But this is a much smaller system, uh, it's a, a known system of four cameras in a small studio. We know what we're kind of, working with. So that was a, that was a, um, a much did more compact those desks, one. Alex? I've never seen, that's oh. a nice desk. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we get all of our desks built, um, design, we design them and build them um, from, with a company called uh, Cabinet Works, and they're out of uh, Ohio. And um, what's great about them is they, they really understand 80-20. So I sit there and just, I draw something in SketchUp that is kind of rough of what I want. And then they I mean, I can literally, they'll get it, they'll rough it out and then I'll sit there with Brian and he'll sit and he has everything in the CAD, like everything CAD in the CAD program. So, um, so he's able to sit there and just kind of in AutoCAD, just uh, constantly updating while I'm talking like, oh, can we make this a little wider? The only thing I would change here, I don't know what got into us to make these um, turrets uh, vertical. I would never do that again. <laughs> and that was my choice. I, I, I remember why we, we did it. We had some reason or thought process, but I, you know, I would always have these turrets uh, tilted if I did it again. So I would tilt them down so that those, so the interfaces were looking up at us um, because they're, they'd be a lot easier to get to behind things and around things. Um, this space also, we were worried about the space behind us. This desk is a little um, too thin. So I would have made it longer if I did it again by about six inches. Um, we had a, our concern was access to the to the um, hardware here, easy reach over, but it was a little too close. So, you know, you you learn as you build these, you kind of go, oh, I won't do that again. I won't do that again. But it's really nice. The, this is a, a good example of 8020, and pretty much all of these are 8020. You'll see them like, you know, kind of hidden, <laughs> the 8020 kind of hidden somewhere, um, you know, in that area. Here you can see that those, see how these turrets have been leaned back? Um, that's, that's to provide a better access to them. You'll see that these, these also are kind of at a, at an angle. So that's the, the thing that I would, uh, that'd be my approach, but yeah, cabinet works is great to, um, to use for that. And that's all I've used for years. Very nice. Rupert. And if you're dealing with yeah, multiple monitors, multiple monitors and multiple inputs, it'll be um, pretty soon that uh, you'll find having a router or, or a yeah, matrix will be a key to the operation so you can just you know route anything to any screen or any input to any output depending on your you know your uh, your setup there in terms of what is normal i mean that's a bit of a strange concept these days but you may want to um think about additional screens you may need for you know back channels with zoom calls with your remote team if you're dealing you're bringing in there uh, if your team is also remote you may need extra screen real estate there to uh, collaborate with them and just make sure you've got backups like everything else next question 
Next one comes to us from Hashid again in Central Florida, and he says, has anyone attempted to use their phone's camera as a webcam via a PC? I recently came across Iron, uh, Iron, and there were a couple of others for Android. Uh, could it be a temporary fix for not having a standalone webcam? Rupert. We covered a little bit of this uh, earlier. It, it, can be a, it, it can be a fix. Uh, it can get you, uh, get you running. Some of the new, newer phones, whatever they are, do produce decent do produce a decent image and there are apps out there certainly that will allow you to um, emulate that as a usb camera on your computer again we've seen i think the better best image quality performance come out of something like filmic pro that would be out via hdmi into a capture device and, and things like that it can be done it can get you out of a um can get you out of a hole or you you know if you have a phone available to dedicate to it then you could set it up even as a more permanent um, solution. But trying to use your phone, the phone that you no use normally as a phone, you know, to be able to back and forth it as a webcam just presents a bit of a challenge in, you know, setting it up, make sure it's, um, you know, aligned and all that, all that stuff. If it's something you're only going to use occasionally, like to get you out of a hole, you do have the challenge then of what uh, John mentioned earlier is that when you come to use that app, you know, you haven't used it in a while, you open it up and it's suddenly not behaving in the same way that it did when um you know you used it before so if it's a temporary fix you kind of have to um test it and rehearse it so that you know it's going to work when uh, when you need it to jeffrey yeah that's the problem with the i ruin or i run is the fact that uh you cannot connect it up directly and then if you run if you run in a day and connect it and any connect to connectivity issues then uh then it, you just uh you're fighting the system there the filmic pro is uh, the one that i'll use when it comes to if i absolutely need to use a phone for it but just as rupert said if you're running if you're in the middle of a show and you're using your actual phone and somebody starts calling you that creates a new nightmare you just don't want to be dealing with right next question Douglas Carmichael's up next. He says, has anyone worked with the Ross Graphite platform? It seems like a higher end version of the TriCaster. Noah. Yes, um, it's been 10 or 12 years now. Um, in high school, I learned the TriCaster. In college, we were cutting on Ross switchers. Um, and then uh, professionally, I worked at a church, and did some Grass Valley stuff. But I would say 90% of what I've switched on now is black magic just because of the level and the place that I'm at in the marketplace. So it really just depends on um, what kind of production you're doing, what's the skill at production. And if you have access to, you know, a raw switcher or TriCaster, Grass Valley, just get as much time on that machine as you can. Talk to the people who know it best and learn as much as you can. Alex. Yeah, and the, and the Ross switcher, from my experience, is a little bit more of a traditional switcher in the sense that it doesn't pack as try to pack as much into one box as the TriCaster does. And the TriCaster has the advantage that it does a lot of things internally, whether it's playback and graphics and so on and so forth. And the Ross will tend to do some of that, but it, you know, like for instance, a Ross switcher is going to expect you to use a Ross expressions to bring the graphics in and it's tied in tightly and so on and so forth. But, but I think that they are, they're, they're, they're slightly different. Uh, it's not just a bigger version of a TriCaster. It's a, it's kind of a different uh, approach and a more modular approach. Next question. Next one comes from Avis Lansden in Riga, Latvia. And he says, Zoom Room 5.9.3, Windows 10 PC. Audio on HDMI output disappears when adding an NDI output. Is this a Zoom problem or do I need to look for a solution on my side? Rupert? I'm not sure if it's a problem. It almost sounds like expected behavior to me. If you're getting the, uh, if you normally get audio out of uh, HDMI, that'll be the Muxed audio system audio, basically out of the um, out of this system. If you are enabling NDI and expecting audio out of that NDI feed, I would expect the system to redirect the audio out of the NDI uh, virtual interface, basically at that point. And therefore I would expect it to no longer be coming out of the HDMI uh, interface. So I would drop, um, maybe might be, maybe drop into After Hours and uh, brainstorm that a little bit. Mm -hmm, Jeffrey. The best way at this point would be to actually use voice meter and then bring in the HDMI and bring in the NDI into two uh, two separate channels if you want to blend those together and then send that out uh, via the VB cable option into your Zoom room from there. All right, next question. Next one comes from Tobias Moss. What's your favorite audio video museum in the world? Tobias? 
empty at the moment. I'm the only answer, but uh, there was the Museum of Television and Broadcasting in, in New York City that got renamed the Paley Center for Media. But it was basically YouTube before YouTube in that they had these endless archives where you could go and uh, pay a fee for 90 minutes of view time and then be able to watch old Knicks games or Tom and Jerry from back in the day or Coke commercials or anything. Um, so I love that museum growing up. Alex? There's one in Toronto that's a similar to that for the Canadian broadcast. Um, and so there it's, uh, and I, all I know is it's near the Paramount of theaters. <laughs> I don't know exactly what it's called, but I used to wander. I used to be in Toronto once a month for, uh, for call for help. And, and I used to go there all the time because you'd see a lot of old stuff that was there, the archive of almost everything that they, that the Canadian broadcast had paid for. And we are going to run over a little bit to answer some more questions and just asking the panelists to make them tight and succinct so we can get to our second hour. Next question. Next one comes from Goran in Slovenia, and he says, any experience with TVU Network, TVU1 specifically, good, bad? Alex. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I was managing something else. Um, the uh, uh, I've not been impressed. I, we've definitely used the TVU um, systems in the past. I would consider uh, Live View and DeGero uh, more stable. Um, I don't know if I've ever had a TVU experience that didn't have some stress of getting the connection working or the connection not working perfectly um, during the event. <laughs> so, so, so it's, it's, uh, I mean, we, we, anytime you're using a cellular system, you're going to have some errata, but TVU has a higher level of that errata compared to DeGero and uh, LiveView. Next question. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. What are those test patterns with Eurovision Washington and DC Switch mean? And what is Eurovision? Alex? Yeah, in the pictures that I showed with, with monitors, you might, you might have seen a feed that said Eurovision and DC Switch. Um, what that meant was is that that's the switch, which, which does transport for networks. Um, that was the DC feed from them. And when there's nothing going on, they just send us a test pattern to, to let us know that it's there and that's what it is. Um, Eurovision is the, uh, is the consortium of many of the broadcaster, national broadcasters from Europe. Um, and all, we used to have our offices in their offices, <laughs> so on the same floor with them. That's where all of the content from the Europe goes into the United States and all of the content from the United States goes out to Europe over these fiber lines. And that's it uh, in Washington, D.C. And so that's what and so those were feeds saying we're getting something from Eurovision. And usually a lot of times we would just get a blank what you saw there. And when they were sending us something, obviously we get a signal and we would get them to send us signals, additional si signals from the switch or um, other other services. Next question. Harshit in Central Florida says, what would be a solid phone stand tripod solution for an adjustable camera phone mount type of a solution to use with Filmic and the phone? And he's got a Pixel 4XL. Noah? Um, I've had some good luck with a DJI um, stabilizer phone gimbal, basically. Um, it does have a desk mount, or not a desk mount, but a little mini tripod as well, um, on the older versions at least. Um, so this is, I guess, Gen 4, and there's a Gen 5 that doesn't have as good of reviews, but um, that's something I've used in the past that um, I thought did pretty well. All right. It looks like we have come to the end of our first hour question. So thank you so much for them as we start off our week. And as you may or may not have recalled last week, we were doing a lot of brainstorming around the topics that you want to hear about. And for Monday being the business day, a popular one was from freelance to business. So there are many of you who may be thinking about, okay, it's time that you actually put together a business structure. And this is the time that we're going to dive into those questions and talk about some of the wins that some of us have had and some of those worst case scenarios. Let's get into it. Bill, first question. Um, it's the open discussion. So everybody just gets a chance to toss their two cents worth in. And um, for those of us who have been in business for a long time, maybe help others who are getting into it for the first time, avoid I'll problems. Let's... Yeah, this was a suggestion that came up, and I thought it would be a good one to kind of kick the year off uh, as we start to work with uh, this this process. Some of us have had have gone from being a freelancer to um, to a business, um, and most of us, when you go from a freelancer to a business, most of us didn't go to business school. Most of us didn't, you know, figure out how to do it. Didn't read enough books, and you just start suddenly going well. I have to, you know, like I, I need more people, and typically the conversion is I need more than 
you know, you need more than yourself. So there's a couple different steps that usually happen between first, you're a freelancer and you're showing up because other people hired you. Then at some point, someone starts to hire you and then you have to freelance out to everybody else. At some point, you're, you may make a decision that you're going to start bringing on employees, um, it, you know, because it, it gives you more stability. Uh, it also um, oftentimes, you know, saves you money you know, to, to not be paying um, margins twice. So, so there's a couple of things that you start to do, but it, it becomes, a, you know, like you just have to pay attention to it. it, it and, and almost all of us did it kind of by accident. <laughs> you know, like it was like, well, I just, you know, I, this, this person's really useful. I think I'll hire them, you know, and, or, or, or something like that. Um, and it is, uh, I think that it, it's probably worth talking a little bit about like, okay, you're now going into business. Um, what are the, you know, and you, all of you can ask those questions. I just kind of wanted to set it up. What are the questions that you have? And all of us have, or some of us have some opinions about things that, uh, that we think we wished we had done differently. I think, I think a lot of it's that. <laughs> I think it's almost always things that we, I think most of us can't say, these are all the things I did right. And I didn't do anything wrong because starting a business is, is oftentimes a messy thing. All right, Bill. So in my history, um, when I originally decided back in, <laughs> seems like the late 1920s, it wasn't that long ago, that I was going to try to do this as a freelance business, one of the pieces of advice that I got was, well, maybe go talk to the Chamber of Commerce because they have a bunch of people who know these things. I am, I am saying that with a big grain, no, not a grain, a tablespoon of salt, because uh, in my experience back in those days, there were some very good things they did. They had a presentation. It took about a half an hour. I think it cost me 10 bucks or something like that. And they talked about the function of why you might need an accountant, why you might need a lawyer, why you not, might need permits, why you might, you know, just the general business thing. Now, these are tend to be local groups. So one of the positives of it is they weren't talking from a national, they were talking about my area, my city, my town specifically. You know, if I needed a particular permit to do something in my back studio, they at least had people around to know that. I did find over the course of time that in trying to fit everybody's individual business in to a one size fits all. And that idea that everybody needs an accountant, everybody needs a lawyer, everybody needs all these things, which are good business things as you grow, you don't really need them up in the beginning. But there was some valuable uh, information that got me thinking about that. And even though I didn't actually need a lawyer for probably the first 10 years of my business, it put the spark there. So when I finally did run into some circumstances where I was having negotiations with bigger clients, I recognize not only that I needed one, but the type of lawyer, in that case, intellectual property, that I should probably consult with to get the right answers for things. So those kind of business groups, I think, can be a little bit helpful. Just be watch out, because part of that is a, is a, a, a let's get our friends who are lawyers and accountants, get them all kind of shopping for new clients as the people come into that. So it's a little bit of a double-edged sword, but it's one piece of advice. Lois? Well, I had a company called The Organizer and I helped people start up businesses, not this kind of businesses, just general little businesses. And what I would say is when you are deciding you're going to go into business, look at similar businesses and see what functions they have to do. So if you're going to have employees, are you going to be an employee manager? Are, you know, have you been an HR person? Well, think about that. Think about how you're going to handle the papers, all of the, the forms and the government stuff and all of the things that every business needs to handle, the licenses and the fees. And then think about what you love to do and what bits you want someone else to take over for you. So if you really enjoy the people part, well, maybe you will keep the people part and hire on an extra engineer. But if you don't like the people part, maybe you'll hire someone to do that while you go do the engineering. So make sure you got all the functions done. And I would say write up a business plan. That's always a good start, whatever your business. Jason? As someone who has been to business school, I can tell you that um, it's not as handy as you think it is. Uh, it teaches you what not to do, you know, how to not get arrested for fraud, that kind of thing. Um, but what it doesn't teach you is how to be successful, which of course is what everybody's after. Um, owning a small business personally for the last dozen years, I can tell you there's no secret, um, there's no secret that you can't kind of 
um, figure out for yourself if you have the right support. Noah? Love that. Yeah, I was probably one of the ones who inspired this topic um, and talked about it and wrote, you know, questions about it. Um, because once COVID hit, like, you know, the world turned upside down for me and I'm just kind of rethinking and restructuring. But uh, I have no formal business school training. Um, I did go to school for um, broadcast, but it's they didn't teach you many um, fundamental business concepts, which is surprising. And so um, the 10 or 12 years that I've been doing this uh, on my own has been just life experience. Um, and I know that there are several holes in my setup, I'm sure. Um, so just kind of leaning on the shoulders of those who came before me, but, um, you know, also learning from the, the great office hours community is, is great. Um, but I'm also realizing and learning personally that I'm trying to um, challenge myself to move away from like doing everything myself and hiring people or, or being around people that can kind of fill in those gaps um, and then also being a backstop. So that's kind of my 2022 goal is to push myself away from being the TD or being a single position and being more of an overseer um, in most of the things that I'm doing. And hopefully those uh, holes will be filled in as well, so. Rupert? This is a, yeah, it's a big topic. It should be a great uh, discussion. I think there's some you know, interesting distinctions between these different phases that we're talking about, about maybe being freelance. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're a freelance, you, you're essentially running, definitely running a business at that point. And you've got your own you know, business uh, concerns. It's subtly different, I think, to running a business, like a business with a brand and a portfolio of services. You know, if you are freelance, you might just simply be charging for your time, you know, on a contract basis. Of course, you're self-employed. Um, and that's but that's that's a um that's not inherently, you know, trying to build a business with with all the other things that we're um, talking about, like branding and marketing and all those things. It can lead to that for sure. And that's the way some people want to want to want to go. And I think that's an important part you know, if you're going to go that route, you know, business plan and all those things that have been talked about, but also exit exit strategy. What is what is the end goal? Are you looking to build a business and sell it, build a business and get acquired, build a business and retire, build a business and and what? You know, it's a, a lot of excitement, um, you know, in the journey, but what is the, uh, what is the destination? Yeah, there's just so much great information has been shared just from the story side of things. But what also when I think about um, when I started my business, I was working at another company and then just spending the time to, as Lois said, getting your business plan together, getting even starting to court clients from that perspective. But then also what most people don't pay attention to is your books <laughs> and the need for um, whether it be a, a CPA, because there is a difference when you're ran, running your business as a freelancer to some of the demands that are needed for you when you are a business entity and then also forecasting and making sure your cash flow and like those kind of elements. So as places like and in the US, places like the score score, which is under the SBA, where there are mainly people who have been retired, retired CEOs or experts in those fields that you can actually go to and they're volunteers. So you can go to them and ask for advice. I I'll look up who is the entity in Canada because I know that they um they have someone as well, but that's when you make that jump from freelancer to now like business and building out a business, like Rupert said, it, many of us are also creatives. This is now taking off your creative hat and really into the operations and systems and automation so that you want your business to run when you're not there. That's a really good way to, to think about it. And Alex? Yeah, that's the best part of the exit strategy is just having a business that doesn't need you. <laughs> you know, that's what you should always be trying to find is a way to be redundant. I mean, one of the things that really limits our opportunity as a freelancer is that you can only be in one place at one time, what we like to call a physics problem, you know, and uh, so, so there, you know, and so that becomes you, and the problem really is you start, you say, well, I just want to be a freelancer. I just want to do my own thing. What happens when you can't cover two jobs at one time and one of your clients even as a company, I got to a point where we had in, a, in 2016, we had a client that, you know, we did about a million dollars a year with, you know, and, uh, but we had other clients that were filling up. I mean, I had, you know, um, I had every able producer that I trusted um, on jobs, you know, and they came to us with two weeks warning and said, we have this job and we couldn't take it on. 
you know, like we couldn't do that job. I, I wasn't willing to fail at it. Um, and we lost the client, you know, like, you know, they, they went to someone else, you know, and that, you know, and that was a hard, you know, that's, that's, that's one of those hard moments as a freelancer, you have to make that choice all the time. You know, we have tons of people that we, we, we freelance out to. And if they say no, a couple of times I stop calling, like, you know, like, unless they're, you know, like I just, not like I'm upset, just like they, they go down on the rib because they're just not available. Like, oh, that's not, that person's never available, <laughs> you know? And, and so, um, and so being the problem with being a freelancer is being successful. So as a freelancer, you have to get good at, you know, are you going to rec recommend other people? And then that they, then they reflect on you. So that becomes harder. So that's why when you start having employees, you can start to, you know, have, you can keep on taking on those businesses. The problem really is, is that, um, you know, that, uh, um, payroll, you know, is, is a thing, you know, cash flow kills. <laughs> we used to have a little sign that cash flow kills, you know, like, you know, like, and, 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 uh, and cash flow is the thing that, you know, how big is your space? How big is your, you know, how big is your staff? You know, people, the, the hard thing that, that I didn't get to until the end was that, you know, you, you know, you have to make hard decisions about payroll, you know, and I held on, <laughs> you know, instead of taking, doing minor layoffs in my last company, I was like unwilling to lay anybody off and I was going to hang through it. And I just plowed that, plowed that system right into the ground. <laughs> you know, like, you know, and, and, and so then they all lost their jobs because I wasn't willing to let anybody go. And so, and to me, that was a pride issue. It was a uh, not wanting to lay people off at Christmas and, you know, like all the things that needed to happen, you know, th those are all the things you, you can feel good about it. And a lot of times when we, 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 we have this big thing, this, this stigma of layoffs and so on and so forth, but you know, um, the human capital is generally the most expensive part of a business. And so when you're trimming things, oftentimes that's where you have to trim, you know, to make those things work. And so if you just start, when you start a business, you have to know that that may come up at some point that you're going to have to let people go. And because they're not appropriate for your business, because you don't have, you, you, that, that part of your business is going away. And it's a really hard part of the business. That's, that's all I'll say is like, that's the, probably the hardest part of the business, in my opinion is the hiring and firing of people, you know, um, because they're people, you know, and, and you have to, you know, you have to interact with them and you don't want to be in that, that position. So that's, that's, that's something that I would just, you, you got to think about beyond all the books and everything else. The people part of it is, you know, complex. Yeah. Jason. Well, and picking up where Alex left off, the human capital is definitely the hardest part, the, you know, the institutional knowledge, it's, but it's also the most valuable, which mm -hmm. is why, uh, you know, once you find the right people, I completely understand not wanting to to get rid of them. Um, and there are a lot of things in production where a traditional, like what you learn in business school uh, model falls apart. Here are a few where it doesn't, but kind of does. Um, so a business plan is a good thing, mostly as a thought experiment. Nobody ever needs to read it. It's actually for you. Um, demand forecasting and feasibility analysis. If you don't know what this is, look it up. It's the way to figure out how and when under the worst circumstances given market demand, if you can become prof profitable. Um, you know, these are the first things you should do before you ever consider being a business of any kind. And the bank, <laughs> the bank might also ask for that, for that business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you need money plan. for sure. Right. <laughs> Rupert. Yeah, there's uh, definitely lots of ups and downs and ins and outs to, to this whole um, whole subject, profit and plan and you know cash flow is all important. You know, that uh, in the business world is called profit and loss. You know, and you'll you'll uh, you'll that um, you'll see two sides two sides to most coins. I think in this in this topic, profit and loss is a good example. You know, how are you going to manage you know your potential losses in in business or freelance or whatever? It's a lot about, okay, you've got the creative and you've got the output, but a big part of it is how do you manage your risks also? And whether that be risks in a project or risks as in the bills coming in through the through the door or risks in terms of employing people. And, you know, you can have, um, you can set yourself up in such a way that you can manage some of those risks and get insurance for some of these risks. But again, use, use insurance as an example. You're insurability you know as a business from a insurance agent for example is going to be um, defined by how well you manage your risks and no matter what your you know your assets are and um, whether it be talent or ip or process or or whatever they could be um, undermined they can be undermined by um un risks that haven't been properly mitigated whether they've 
occurred or not, you know, you need to be um, diligent in how you, you manage that um, stuff. Same with, you know, engaging work. You know, if you're going with a client and you're going to engage in a contract, you may need to go through some kind of due diligence process and you know, that might uncover things that they are, the client potentially is unwilling to engage in because of. So you just really need to set yourself up in a, you know, diligent way so that you can be insurable, that you can engage with the, the, in the contract, the types of contracts that you want to be able to um, work in. And Lois. So what we're talking about here is makes the assumption that it's freelance or it's business. There's actually quite a range of things that you can do. If you've been doing a freelance thing and you say, okay, what's going to happen if I get sick? Well, I can't work, therefore I don't have any money. How can I have an income even if I'm not there? Well, make a make a business, all right? You could be the owner, hire employees, have all the stuff, be a full-on business. But you could also decide that I'm a freelancer, I have a friend, has a friend, the three of us together could make a co-op or a joint owned thing so that we're partners. And so if one of us gets sick, the other two can cover. And so you can make a business that is not a, I'm the boss, you're the employees, but is more of a uh, an equal sort of a thing. You could decide that your freelance project is great, but maybe you want to get into renting equipment instead of being the person who's the operator. And so there's lots of ranges of things. It's not really either or. Yeah, and, and at the end of the day, everyone is figuring it out. It's just a degree of where they are in the process. Let's go to the next question. Next question comes from Noah Sargent and Fullerton. He says, do you still crew for other productions when starting your own business? And when would you recommend phasing it out, if at all? Alex. I'll tell you when. I figure out how to stop, <laughs> you know, being crewing out, you know, so, you know, so a lot of times, uh, I'm still a required component of, of jobs, you know, so our clients will expect me to be on that job and, and or sometimes I get into a consulting role where I'm spending anywhere from half to all my time working for a client. Um, as, as you go up in the management role of, of the company, I try to minimize that as best I can to not ever have it be more than half of my time. Um, if, and it's only if it, we're in some kind of cutting edge, you know, I'm one of the only people that I know that can do that thing in the world. If we can hire somebody else to do it, we hire somebody else to do it. It's, it's not an efficient use of your time as you move into up into management. It is useful to keep your sword sharp. <laughs> so, um, so not doing any of it or not ever showing up for an event is will have you get away from understanding your business. Um, and so I think that I, I have always wanted to at least spend some time doing production um, I used to feel like when my company got to a point where it was in like kind of the, you know, at, there was a point where I was like in the six to 8 million a year range that it was like, a, I felt like I was spending all my time in keynote in Excel or in, in numbers, numbers and keynote was all I did. Cause I was, you know, now managing all this stuff and I didn't do anything. And so, um, a lot of times what I used at the time was I'd go to Africa where I still was hands-on. So I'd, I'd go to Rwanda and work with our students and I'd be doing, all the things, things that I couldn't afford to do, because to be honest with you, at that moment, I wasn't good enough. Like I had, I had hired people that were better at what they did than I was and were doing it every day for our clients. And I wasn't, I wasn't staying sharp. So finding a place to, I think, um, stay sharp. And now I, you know, I've been fortunate enough in oh nine oh to, to basically, uh, still work on productions, um, so that I can, it allows me to keep thinking about it and allows me to develop better business models. Lois. I misread that or I read it differently. Uh, I don't think he was talking about working on projects of your company, but rather also being a freelancer at the same time you're starting a company. And I wonder if that might be a, a good one to answer. Well, we have Noah here to let us know. <laughs> Noah? Uh, I like both perspectives. Yeah, I mean, um, I've noticed that sometimes I'll word something a certain way and somebody will interpret it differently. And I love how it came out too, because um, yeah, Alex is talking like within his own structure and production, uh, which is what kind of like I was referring to earlier is I'm also trying to remove myself from that uh, and be the backstop or overseer, I guess you can say. Uh, but yeah, as far as I still will work for other companies um, as needed, I think it's more of a networking thing. Um, and also just like seeing 
and learning from other people and other productions, um, kind of like a spot check. I've noticed that um, I did work for one um, commercial company and the director only worked for his shows for like 30 years. And so he had a specific way of doing it and it was almost like a bubble, like he only stayed within his circle and didn't really learn from anybody else. And so I felt like that experience going to multiple productions helps me be better and more rounded. Bill? I would say if you're going to try to do this, make sure your business ethics are scrupulous. And what I mean by that is that if you are starting your business and if you are anywhere in the area that um, your previous that people have previously been hiring you for to do for them, if ever a cent of you are doing that to shop their clients comes out, you are destroyed. So make sure that when you go to be a crew member on something else, if you have your own gig on the side, that is verboten to ever mention, discuss, or even hint at. You wanna make sure that while you're working as a paid employee for a client, you respect that client a thousand percent. Yes. And there are times I've seen too, that even before you come on, that they make you sign documents. So definitely respect that. It's like the code, like respect the code, um, Alex. Yeah. And it can get, one of the big things with business in general is just don't be weird. You know, and what I mean by that is that like, I, I used to tell our guys this all the time is they, they think of some way to do something that made sense in their head. But I was like, you have to not understand how it makes sense for the client in their head. And it can't be weird cannot be weird um, unless it's really breakthrough and it's going to do something new or whatever. And so when you do something where the client knows you as, oh, they work for this company, but they also freelance and da, 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 what that feels for the client is small. It feels weird and small, you know? And so you have to be super careful of if you're like, like a, like someone who has like three different business cards, like, or someone who lists the three different businesses that they do on LinkedIn, it's always a weird thing. Like, it's like, they're not really doing any one of those from a client's perspective, you know? And so, you know, it depends on where you want to go with your business. If you're constantly jiving, you know, you know, you know, all moving around and, and trying to take all these, you know, trying to move through things, through, it might make sense. But I'm often careful that I don't have two businesses that I'm running at the same time in the same way, you know, like it's, they can be two, like, oh, I have this little hobby or something, or I have a, like for, for me, you know, I have own, I know, and then I have. Uh, office hours is, is a nonprofit <laughs> that is not making money. Everything I do that makes money goes through and I know, and I, and I, you know, it's, it's like, if, if someone wants to hire me, they have to hire the company, you know? And, and so like, that's a, and, and, and that's just, and then, and the same thing with pixel core, it was like the money all goes through pixel core. It didn't go through me sidestepping pixel core when it was done, done that way, because that's weird, you know, like it's, it's weird for the clients and they will, a lot of times they won't say anything, they won't complain, but in the back of their head, what you're always trying to do is, I mean, I don't know if you're always trying to do this. What I was always trying to do is move up the food chain. Like how do I work, you know, with bigger clients and how do clients feel like they can depend on you? And so much of this is a confidence process, you know, with the clients. So, and it is a weird place for freelancers to have, well, I have this business and then I do my own thing and everything else. I would put it all into something. It's really hard to run a business when it's the only thing you're paying attention to. If you're paying attention to a bunch of things, it gets harder. Yeah, and essentially even with what Alex is saying, that's like your brand. Like what do people know you as? And just being very mindful of that. Next question. Eduardo Augustine in Panama is up next. And Eduardo says, how to make a sustainable production business when clients don't understand the value in live streaming? Which strategies could be applied to thrive? Rupert? In terms of uh, clients, you know, I mean, part of your, your whether it's your market research or your business plan, will be for, will be seeking out the, hopefully the types of clients that recognize the value in what it is you have to offer, and I think that's um, I think that's quite important to you know focus on the, the customers who, do recognize the value and and then be also have the the money money to afford it and you know, at the value you want to um, provide it, and. To be quite frank, I think a lot of it is about filtering out the rest of them. You know, a lot of a lot of clients you may not want to work for. They may not recognize the value. They may not have the money. They may not want to spend the money. You know, they may want to waste your time. Filter those out and just focus on the folks who do see the value and do have the money and want to do the project. Alex? 
in general, we're going to probably spend another hour on this at some point. This is a great second hour, um, you know, subject in general. So we'll, we'll probably take this on separately. Um, but what I will say is that uh, I underestimated for a long time advertising. I thought because I'm so busy, I had all the work I could possibly have. Why would I advertise, you know, to get more of something that's drowning me at the moment? But what I didn't get was that advertising would give me more, advertising would give me more choices. I, I have a higher to what Rupert was talking about. I have a higher number of people coming through and I have, I can start choosing between them as opposed to taking on every, you know, when you, the thing you'll, you'll get my, my mom, <laughs> my family has a lot of business, uh, starts businesses. And my mother used to always say there are two kinds of people to her. There's, there's a people on payroll, people trying to make payroll, you know, like, you know, and to her, you know, like, cause the one thing you, you won't get until you start a small business is how much payroll becomes your attention. Like you just are, Every, every two weeks, you're just thinking about, I mean, literally when you talk to your, to someone you're working for, you, you don't know this until you're a business person that in the back of their head, when you have less than 50 employees in the back of your head, almost everything is this, this little machine of how am I going to make payroll? How am I going to make payroll? So when you complain about the toilet paper or the, the kitchen or whatever, that's not what your business owner's thinking about. <laughs> They're thinking about payroll, you know? And, um, and so you just have to, um, uh, but what I, what I didn't get in that sense of me focused on that was that I wasn't getting to choose and grow my business in the direction that I wanted. Advertising lets you put something out there and grow the business the direction you want because you advertise what you want to do next um, as opposed to what you're doing right now. And you can get caught up in this wheel of something that pays the bills but doesn't take you anywhere, you know, and that's just a kind of a rat race. And you, now you're just working, you know, to, to make payroll. There's this terminology that's used called customer discovery. And just in reading this question, just making sure you do have the right customers and ways to go through that is anyone who has done work with you in the past is asking them and making sure that you keep warm in asking them what's next, what's coming up, what any problems that they had. Because when you figure out what the pain is, people will pain like when you've got a headache, you jump for that, you know, whatever painkiller. So just looking at this, you don't want to always have to be over educating someone to work with you because then you're thinking about you're spending a lot of energy when there's someone with a headache who really wants to work with you. Um, Noah. Yeah, and speaking of education, I feel like um, there's obviously going to there is a need for that, like within our industry, um, to educate you know business people and other people outside of our industry of what our capabilities are and what um, the value that we offer to clients. Um, but ultimately, if you're in a position where you're trying to convince somebody that your services are worthwhile, like that's a, a huge uphill battle. And um, honestly, I, there's no better way of saying it other than like you're wasting some of your time <laughs> um, because they've really got to see that value um, for it to be worth it to them. If you're trying to convince somebody, then you're, you know, barking up the wrong tree. Um, but another thing going back to Chris Doe, um, another YouTube channel, the future that I follow is he talks about like if you show that you're hungry and you're desperate for the work, um, you're also at a disadvantage. So um, you want to be in a place and be willing to say no and turn down something, especially if it's not, um, valuing you as far as uh, your finances and the, you know, the value that you're putting into that project as well. Alex? I also often think for the clients that I'm working with, I think in very long terms as well. I'm not trying to sell them on the value of something in one conversation. I'm sending them little clips every once in a while. Hey, you might find this cool. You might want to see this. You might want to see that. To kind of tell a story there, I don't do it all the time. I do it when there's something really that sticks out that might be interesting. And it's not I, I, it's just so that they understand what's going on, you know, and if I see a good stat, I keep it in my head, you know, like the, you know, that this is happening, this, and I, and I'll oftentimes just mention it as a side, as a side thing. Oh, by the way, this is, da, 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 you know, and, and I'll use it in a presentation, but I, but I keep those things. It, it's really, you know, I don't ever want to sell, to be honest, you know, and so, so for me, I'm always just having a conversation and a relationship with our, with, with a client or with, you know, what I think of more as our partners. And, um, you know, they're just in, they are until they're not, <laughs> you know? and, and, but when they're in there, when they're in that circle, I'm just sharing the things that I'm excited about or the things that I'm interested in going down the path of. And then they know that you, you really care about them, that it's not right. just when something, um, there's a project on the table. Yeah. Next question. Next one comes from Eduardo Augustine in Panama. And Eduardo says, when is the right time to hire employees in a small production company? Been working with freelancers for now. Rupert? 
like with so many things, I don't think there's like an absolute correct answer to this. You know, the production, just like many other verticals, has you know seen a um, some move, you know, some churn in the in the labor market, where there's availability of talent, where the people are, you know, going from jobs to freelance, and so I think that all has an impact, or you know, can change the dynamics of when isn't isn't the right time, or when it isn't isn't possible. You know, it may be the right time, but it might be impossible. Um, so you have to keep those things in mind. In terms of you know going from freelancer again to moving to a position where you are going to want to employ people. That's another reason maybe to decide the structure in which you're going to do it. We talked earlier about whether, you know, you're going to be self-employed or you're going to form an entity, i.e. a company, um, a legal entity. And and so that's, a, I think, an important point. Are you If you're going to employ people, are you personally going to employ them or are you going to form a business entity and have that entity employ them as a, you know, employment relationship? Alex? I would say when you have sustainable income. <laughs> Like you have to know where the money's coming from. That is the, that's the key is, is, you know, you can't, you know, I would not recommend hiring people past, uh, you know, it's, it's really dangerous to hire past your income. So, so I think that that is the thing that you want to look at. And, and if I had a three month contract, I'd hire people for three months. You know, if I had a, you know, cause I, I have those things where I get a contract that's six months long and we hire someone as an employee for those six months with the expectation that when this ends, it ends. And I would keep those expectations going with everybody so that they know that that's, they're a short term hire. Um, at some point you convert to a long term because you now have enough work coming in all the time that you don't need to have them connected to any specific job um, uh, for that process. But but at the beginning, you have to know where that income's coming from over a long term uh, before you hire, because it's not fair to them either, you know, to, to be hired and then dropped immediately. Very true. Lois? So outside what your desires are in what is good for your company, you also need to look at what's going on in the outside world. You chose to become from a freelancer to a business owner. You didn't choose to become an employee. Well, why did you make that choice? Are the people who are you are hiring as freelancers, are they interested in becoming employees? Do they like being a freelancer? Are they going to go start their own business? So you so who you are going to hire is also something to consider. And another thing is where you live and what the government rules are. You may find that there are times when you think someone's a freelancer and the government says, uh, no, <laughs> that's an employee. So make sure that you understand the difference between those things and look at it from the outside as well as the inside. Very good point, Lois. Next question. Next one comes from Noah Sargent here on the panel from Fullerton, California. How have you managed your finances for business? Rupert? Oh, sorry. John. Thank you, Liberty. Um, so so more importantly than a platform, which, which Todd asks in the upcoming question, is to find a good accountant uh, to do books for you. They're going to probably choose QuickBooks. QuickBooks online version is what I've used for the last two decades probably, or maybe 15 years. And, but you have to trust this person. My guy does all of my work for the, my last five companies and, and they have full access to all your finances. So this is a, a very important relationship that you need to foster over, over time. I mean, give them limited access over time, like a stratified kind of a access to all your finances, but find a good person. QuickBooks is online this is what I use for years and years and years. Lois. Well, actually, he's got it right on. QuickBooks is a wonderful program. Uh, understand that there's a slight difference between bookkeeping and finances. So bookkeeping is taking care of the numbers, writing down, making sure it all balances. That's easy. Finances is a little bit more complicated. So if it's something you really like to do and you want to do QuickBooks yourself, that's fine. Uh, but it's probably if you're in this business to do your business, you're probably going to hire it out. Rupert. Exactly. There's the bookie, bookkeeping element, which is, you know, you're, you, that's something that happens all the time, you know, your month, whether it's weekly expenses or monthly bills or payrolls or whatever, then there's a, then there is the wider aspect of it, like annual tax returns or annual reports or annual audits or whatever those annual markers are. And then there's the long-term financial kind of strategy stuff you want to, um, will want, that you may also want to keep in mind the um, systems like QuickBooks, are great that will help you and whoever is helping you you know that's a a win-win win-win uh, 
relationship. I, whether you know you are self-employed or whether you're forming a entity, uh, it's always I, in my view. It's always better to keep your business finances separate. You know, so separate account, separate this, separate that, and then you know it just helps you uh, draw that um, draw that line. Alex. Yeah, I think that some of the basics that haven't been covered already is. Uh, whoever's signing the check should be someone you really trust and you should have maybe one person do it. You know, like it was, you know, like that, that you know, don't have a lot of people. And, and even in the very largest companies that you work with, there'll be like four people that can sign checks. You know, that is a, you know, so signing checks is a, is a thing and you want to be very, very careful. I wouldn't even hand that off to our accountant, you know, to, to sign a check. Um, it, it's also just keeps some, some, that someone's accountable for it, that, that you, that you really trust, especially as you get started. Um, the, the other thing is, is that I really underestimated in my, when I did my company of how important projections are, you know, you can make calculations of this is how much this is going to cost and this is the revenue and this is, and then you start making smart decisions about what, you know, where you could cut, you know, if I cut the cost of this by 10%, I'll have a hundred thousand dollars at the end of the year, you know, or something like that. You know, like it's, it's, it, it, the numbers can add up a lot. The one thing I will be, would be careful of is, is, um, just be careful of people who have uh, kind of tricky ways of making money, you know, tricky accounting schemes or tax schemes is, are usually, um, a, uh, um, is dangerous, you know, like it just, you know, and, and so, you know, try to, it's just basic ball handling skills, you know, for the most part, um, I would try to keep it as simple as possible and, unless you're really good at it. Rupert. Yeah. To the, to the tricky point, that's absolutely right. I mean, if you're, if you're doing any of this and you later want to get into a relationship with somebody who may want to acquire you or you want to get insurance, you're going to have to open up all your books for inspection, you know, go through that due diligence. So you just don't want anything there that's going to, you know, cause a problem for anybody, you know, that you may want to be getting into a relationship with uh, later down the line in terms of uh, signing checks and, and, um, levels of authority that's absolutely right and of course that translates into the digital realm these days with you know bank transfers or access to the online banking or to be able to make payments you know typically in in any environment that's been set up uh, correctly you'll have you know dual uh, i mean everybody will have uh, multi-factor authentication but you'll need two uh, authorities to make a payment for example you know even online some some be a line up the payment and then somebody else will have to go in and authorize it that kind of you know uh, oversight is uh, is a good idea next question eduardo argenstein is back again from panama he says when does a freelancer shift to a business is there a blueprint on requirements to get to the business phase rupert sorry i have my hand up by mistake on that one okay uh, <laughs> alex yeah i mean i think that again when it comes down to i don't think there's a business plan. Again, what I, what I find is the most common way that people do this is you are a freelancer, then you start freelancing to other people, you know, so you're, you're building a business around something where you're now depending on other freelancers. They're not full-time employees. And then that business gets to a point where you need a person to manage the books, a person, uh, you know, uh, uh, someone to answer the phones. It becomes kind of, and you're still freelancing out to everybody. And then there's some point where you make a turn when you start hiring technical staff. But I, it usually doesn't happen faster than that. It usually happens, and I would recommend not going any faster than that. Um, you know, hiring the te technical talent, especially that oftentimes is more expensive, creates a, a big overhead hit you know, pretty quickly if you're not connected to something. So, um, so that's where, but that's what I've seen so far. Bill? Well, here in the U.S., part of this is regulatory and it has to do with the form of business you're in. Most people, if they're freelancing and they decide they're going to start a business, a lot of them start out as sole proprietorships, which is one uh, category under standard accounting rules in U.S. that all the CPAs understand. Uh, sometimes there are other forms. There's limited partnerships and there's corporations and each of them have a different structural requirement to be that. So at one point it's technical. I'm assuming that there are similar things in Panama where you are. Uh, so if nothing else, I would talk to either your banker or a CPA or somebody who understands how things are structured in your area. Because one definition of becoming a business is to switch from just filing your personal taxes and claiming your personal income to operating an entity that is responsible for the money coming in, the money going out, and the accounting, therefore. Next question. 
Next one coming up from Tobias Moss in Minneapolis. Does anyone freelance primarily for a nonprofit organizations? What are some of the nuances of freelancing for that work? Jesse? All right, so about um, half of our clients are NPOs and they account for, I think like three quarters of our annual income. So we have a lot of experience with NPOs and what, what you can expect, how some, uh, some of the differences are, first of all, um, the staff at NPOs are generally very, very fantastic to work with. They are there because they want to be there and they will be so happy to welcome a media team because everybody on the staff knows how important their front facing view is to the rest of the world. That that's like the difference between longevity in the NPO or uh, dissipating in the next year or two. So they're generally very welcoming and very excited about uh, collaborating with with media professionals and they generally okay, so, yeah let's we'll go on to rupert jesse go and ahead. then if it comes in you can come back mm -hmm. i um i've never done this primarily but I, i've had some exposures to nonprofits at all kinds of uh, different levels and i would i would just say that there is of course a range out there you have some you know smaller nonprofits who are very co cost conscious or they um, they may have some other <laughs> characteristics like they may not always appreciate the value of time but uh, i've also seen some non-profits that uh, are dealing in much higher numbers you know and uh, are prepared to um, spend what it takes to get um, you know a serious event done where the stakes for them are are pretty high so it it, it can depend alex yeah I I think I would definitely, to, to what was said just, just previously here, is that small and medium-sized nonprofits, from my experience, uh, the biggest problem with, biggest challenge with working with nonprofits from, from my experience has been uh, that they don't value time in the same way because they have so many volunteers. <laughs> so, so they tend to, you know, not think about that very much and they'll tend to ask for a lot of things that, that can be, that can, as a company can, or a freelancer can grind you into the, into the ground. So you just have to be, kind of know where those limits are on your end because a lot of times you're taking on a nonprofit because you care about what they're doing. And so you're more likely to do that as well. As nonprofits get larger, they tend to be more businesslike and just kind of have a structure and, and a way that they do stuff. And say budgeting, like their budget <laughs> for, for many of them, but then also shifting priorities. So if someone comes in or the executive director, like that could immediately shift when something like a shoot will happen or whatnot. So just some of them being volatile from that perspective. Bill? Yeah, I had a strategy toward the end. I used to hold two spots a year to work with nonprofits. I would not announce that or tell anybody, but I would try to do two projects that were not for for-profit companies. Hopefully they were 501c3s or somebody that I had a true personal connection with. I would do that because those were always the project I got to expand upon my creativity a little because they weren't costing uh, they, they weren't paying full rates. But in that area, I learned to always charge them my full standard rates for every bit of work that I did. And then I would make a donation back to that organization of whatever discount I had. It kept my taxes clear because I knew what was coming in and I knew what I was going to deduct from the donation back. The other thing, though, was that I never got in that situation where another nonprofit was saying, hey, you only charge them, you know, 50 bucks an hour and you're charging me $200 an hour. And you know, I need, I'm just as good a charity as them only charge me 25 bucks an hour. You just take those off. No, everybody's getting charged the same thing. But I do believe in your 501c3 official status and I do want to support your organization. So here's my check. Next question. Next check comes from Todd Reynolds in North Adams, Massachusetts. What's the panel chosen software for bookkeeping? We're having real difficulty finding stability, reliable, reliability, and decent customer service. Alex? I can't say that I, we, we've liked any of them. We've tried a lot of different ones and, and I I'm actually don't know what Oh No I Know does, but I can tell you what Pixelcore uh, um, uh, did is, is uh, QuickBooks. <laughs> you know, and a lot of people use QuickBooks. Um, I, I couldn't, we tried a couple other things and you know, while we're not ecstatic about QuickBooks, uh, it was the best of, the, of those options that we had. Rupert? I uh, used to support a lot of QuickBooks and 
um, you know, on-prem installations of uh, QuickBooks. And I'm just like so, so many other things, I'm glad that is now available in the cloud. I, I, and we use it in the cloud. Right. Yeah. I, uh, I don't, um, I, there's very minimal use cases for using anything on, on-prem these days, unless you have some very specific requirement that uh, puts you in that, in that category. But um, in terms of the, you know, the cloud platforms, QuickBooks is, is, is a, is a good one. The, the, the thing is, is that if you're working with a CPA who you trust and have a relationship with, the kind of important thing is that you're using something that they support and that they are, you know, they, that they can get behind that the, the data is interoperable. You know, if you're using some um, marginal system, then the chances of that being a sort of successful handoff to, you know, whoever it is you're working with is just reduced. So I always like to um, make sure I'm, you know, I'm going to, if, if I have a relationship with an accountant CPA, I'm holding them accountable for their work that they do for me. And my part in that relationship is to use the system that, that they can recommend that, that they cannot then blame for something going wrong. You know, I want them to take accountability for that decision also. Next question. Next one comes from uh, Henny, uh, Kenny Hampton in Greenville, Illinois. And Kenny says, are there front I think you skipped one. You skipped oh, one there. Did yeah. I? Yeah, I... Yeah, something's going on with our... I think Things we we're not yeah. getting clicked and so... What I can t tell you, this is a little inside baseball. We have too many people uh, touching the questions, so we're going to fix that before for tomorrow. So the way we're doing it isn't working. I'm just letting the people know that. Like, we can't have more than so many people touching him. So anyway... So is it the Noah Sargent question? Let me push yeah. that back yes. over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank Noah you. Sargent says, when do you consider taking on debt? So far, I've slowly built my business without going into debt, and I don't plan to, but it's worth asking. Alex. Uh, as best you can, <laughs> try to stay out of debt. Uh, you know, and and if you're going to take on debt, this is where um, systematizing it is really, really important. Uh, so my, you know, what you want to do is, uh, as best you can, you want to try to over time because it takes a long time is to slowly extricate your personal finances from your company's finances. No one will let you do that when you start. They're all going to want you to back your credit cards and back this and back that. But you want to slowly move away from co-signing your your credit to your of your company. So that's why you want to build an LLC or a, or a C corp or S corp or whatever, however you want to set that up. But you want a separate entity, and then you want to keep on trying to apply for things that will allow you to have two hundred fifty dollars. <laughs> Doesn't matter, you know, five hundred dollars, because what you want to do is roll that over all the time. So you want to roll the debt over. So even if you get a two hundred fifty dollar card, yeah, it's totally useless, and just pay something that always is there, and then pay it off. And keep paying it off, um, you know. And so you want to build that up because the other thing you want to do is slowly get a line of credit because it is going to allow you to do things. So line of credits are good, but as someone who's had really large line of credits, I would I would recommend having it against your personal assets. It, uh, you know, it, it's a little it's stressful. So um, so uh, and you have to be careful of when you sign those things because, like for instance, I had a situation where I signed I signed up debt when I didn't own anything, like a house, and then I got a house. It's still there. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It does, it, it, the time doesn't start when you, you know, when you, uh, you know, it doesn't look at what you have now. It looks at what you have while you're in that, in that situation. So, so you need to be very careful about your personal separating those out. As some, I can tell you that as someone who didn't do it very well, um, that I would, I would recommend against uh, or recommend trying to extricate your, um, your debt. And if you take out debt, know where the money is going to come from and then pay it back, like just pay it down. Like if you're going to take debt out on because you're going to get something, you got to know when and have a business model of how you're going to pay it off and pay it off quickly. Um, if you, you know, it's not going to ever be like you can, as you grow a business, you're not going to be able to, there's growth versus safety. And there's a point where you're going to have to take on debt. And that might be buying plane tickets, you know, for a job that you know you're going to get paid for or, or whatever. But trying to extend yourself as little as possible. And, and also that's where the best freelancers that I know that have grown into businesses tucked away a lot of money, you know, like they just kept huge. I mean, I, I, I would never, I was they're like, I'd be like, how much, you know, like they're like, oh, I'll just pay for that. And they pay like $30,000 for something. And I was like, did you borrow that? And I, and, and they're, you know, they, they'd have like a quarter million dollars that they'd saved over 10 years. You know, they, they just had this slush fund. So they were borrowing from themselves. That's the most efficient way to do it. I don't know very many people that have pulled it off, but if you can, over time, you build up this, this slush fund that is your, basically you're the bank. Um, you know, there's other families that I know also that have done that where they build their own bank that people are taking money in it, that family members are taking money in and out of that. They buy houses, they buy equipment, they buy all these other things, but they're not paying um, interest back to somebody else. So, 
Rupert? So that that can come in various shapes and for, shapes and sizes, and and that will appear on your P and L as a as a liability. Now, just like uh, Alex said, you can you know can manifest its way into um, you know being secured against your assets. All kinds all kinds of complications uh, there, but it it can appear in other ways too. If you have vendors on particularly long terms, I mean, if you have bills that you owe, that is that is debt, whether it's money that's been lent lent to you over a line of credit or goods or services that have been supplied to you that you haven't yet paid for and still a still a debt um it's it's uh again no one size fits all but it'll all show up on your, your p l and again debts if you're carrying debts around again if you're thinking of a longer term plan like acquisition like like getting insurance like getting anything else further down the line all that stuff's going to be inspected so just if it's a path you're going to go down you need to be able to stand behind it and you need it to be able to stand up you know, after a, at a sort of inspection. Alex? Yeah, lease agreements, like your rent is a debt because <laughs> you have to pay it. So, you know, those are all things to keep in mind is that you're, you are, um, you know, anything that requires you to keep on paying into the future, you want to think about as a liability at least. Next question. Kenny Hampton in Greenville, Illinois is next. And he says, are there front end office services specific to small AV businesses to channel calls and logistics to allow you as the business owner to concentrate on the creative side of the business? Alex? Yeah, the, there's a couple things that I that we hand off a lot, you know, so obviously um, the thing you want to hand off quickly is anything that inc that includes errands, things that need to go pick, get picked up. You do not want to do that yourself as a, as a business owner. Um, that is a horribly inefficient way to use your time. Um, and so you want to be very, a lot of business owners want to do everything themselves because they don't want to pay for someone, but you got to think about someone you're paying X amount per hour versus you creating more business. So errands are something that um, are something that you want to try to handle. Anything that is, is stuff that you can hire someone for, you want to try to figure out how to do that. The second thing though, is that clients is not something that I usually hand off. <laughs> so, so the, you know, client communication is something that's really, really important. And I would, you know, be very, very careful about even having someone answer the phone, you know, with them, you want your clients to have direct access to you um, and be, you know, unless you've decided to hand them off to someone else in the company. But as you get started, be super careful. A, a someone working in the front of the front office, having a bad day, being a little quick with a client can be super expensive. So you just, you know, because they don't see the context of what that phone call might have meant to someone um, lost, just them misconnecting you and not getting you, you you're not getting there. So those are all things, you know, t taking phone calls until you're larger from your clients is something you want to be super careful not to hand off uh, lightly. Lois? Well, whenever you're doing this, if you've got someone who is providing the service for you to take calls, and I'm sure that a lot of the folks in here are going to go mechanical route and have recorded messages and stuff, periodically, and I would say frequently, either you call in to the business or have one of your friends call into the business and see what the experience is. So you don't end up in a situation where there are things going wrong that you don't know about. You think they're great but maybe there's a, a big long wait time for you and people are gonna hang up after however many minutes. So keep track of what's happening. If you hire it out, check up on them. Good point. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. He says, how would you market the advantages of bell fasting productions to clients that may be skeptical of the method? I'll jump in here with this is we've said this a lot of times is showing showing finding if there's a way that you can do a test product or a test event for them and walk them through that. So it, this is where, as was mentioned before, I think Noah also brought that up the education part of things so that you can give them an idea of what it is, how to impact, show them any other examples if possible. And it, it really is about having almost like a pilot product that you can um, you can share with them. Alex? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that we're going to make this a second hour, put that into the session suggestions, but there's a whole thing about, I think this combines back with like understanding how to market live streaming and virtual events, I think is probably a whole uh, second hour. Next question. Uh, the next one comes from uh, Kenny Hampton, I believe in Greenville. Nope, it's gone. Let's that see. That was already the there. 
Go yeah, ahead. Douglas Carmichael. Have there been social impact businesses that employ hard to employ populations, those on the spectrum with disabilities? Do you think that a PCX like company uh, focused on that population could have a positive impact? Alex? I, I think the real the real opportunity there is to is to have folks with all kinds of everybody's got their own challenges. You know? So figuring out what those challenges are and figuring out where people fit um, in, into, a, into a system. I wouldn't necessarily focus on having everybody in one place to focus on that. I would really try to find a way that we have the folks that have whatever that, that issue is uh, in, in whatever spectrum um, that they are, you just find a good place that, that they are successful. I've had employees that were horrible employees in one place and I put them somewhere else and they were superstars. You know, and so it's just a matter of, and, and that was a big lesson for me in the, how important the context was. When I put them in the right environment, they suddenly just sprouted up and they were doing great things. In the wrong environment, they were all kinds of trouble, you know, and so, and it wasn't about them. <laughs> like it wasn't them. It was what they were being asked to do. And so figuring that, that out is a, is a real um, Tetris process for a company. And any time that I've seen anything like what you're asking, Douglas, is uh, filed under like workforce development, where they are looking at specific communities and helping them to learn new skills and helping them with employment. Next question. Uh, the next one's pretty similar, Douglas, but I think it's a little bit different. He says in this one, would there be any resources that could mentor and support those with social challenges, like being on the to autism spectrum, in becoming professionals in our industry specifically? Alex. There's some companies that have whole specialists that do that. For instance, like Microsoft has an autism specialist that just simply focuses on how to uh, incorporate folks on the spectrum into, uh, into Microsoft um, and make that work. So you might want to research what companies uh, do that. They, usually they're a larger company because they have the resources to have to start to specialize in that area. Um, but they definitely invest in that. Noah? I can't speak specifically to the, the disability side of this question, but as far as the mentorship, um, that's one of my favorite parts of my week is talking to my mentors uh, about what I'm doing and what the future could hold. So um, I would definitely encourage everybody to look into that as well, to look into mentorships and that kind of stuff. Next question. Uh, it looks like a regular first hour question I got in things. He says, which prompter for a pan tilt zoom camera? Bill? And I'm going to say it's exactly the same rules as any other prompter installation, which is how far is the camera need to be away from the person who needs to read the camera and how big a teleprompter can you afford to put in front of that such that the person is not overwhelmed by the size of the teleprompter, but it's big enough for them to see at the appropriate distance. Uh, the farther the camera goes back, the larger a screen you need for reading it comfortably. Uh, and it's going to depend also on the visual acuity of the person reading it if they have you know any sort of eyesight issues at all and they they're not corrected perfectly uh bigger is always going to be better because it'll give them a better chance of reading things noah yeah and bill is speaking to the distance between the prompter and the person reading right um, as far as the ptz side of it goes there is a robo prompter from prompter people um it, it is kind of expensive so I think in the future on office hours, we're considering building our own prompter. <laughs> so maybe we could uh, incorporate that. But basically on the back of the prompter, there's a snoot or like a hole basically right now for um, cameras. And then in a robo, there's it's more of like a box that has an opening, right? So maybe uh, that could be something uh, as an option we look at for building if we do that on the show. Alex. Yeah, you can build one or you can buy one. Prompter People is the only company that I know that makes that one specifically because you can't use a standard prompter because of that. Um, it'll it'll actually even if it works it'll slowly damage the ptz if if you attach the the typical uh, fabric snoot that that goes onto it so you have to put it in a box that sits in there and uh and that that works fine um, it's just a black box there but that is a um specific to that to ptz um and uh, the design is simple with all teleprompters the design is relatively simple it's just finding someone that makes it you either make it yourself and I, again prompter people have kind of cornered that market for the kind of the medium to high end uh, prompters until you go to like auto queue and others like that. Well, we've come to the end of today's show. Thank you so much for joining us and for your great questions. And it looks like we've even got more questions for future second hours. And I'll hand it back to you, Alex. Yeah, great work. Great work, Liberty. And uh, great work to our producers. A great set of questions. I hope that I hope people enjoyed that uh, conversation. I think it, it was a 
it's one that needs to be had every once in a while. <laughs> and hopefully we can keep on, you know, the, the Mondays are going to be more business oriented of marketing, uh, nuts and bolts about the business end of things, um, that, that type of thing, um, business opportunities, those types of things. And Fridays will be more of how to get things done. Um, so, so if you have those ideas, make sure to go into discord and ask and put them into the second hour suggestions that like we, we did a brainstorming. We've got tons of them. This was an example of one that was taken out of that brainstorming and we'll keep continue to do that. Um, a note that uh, I'm not sure exactly when it'll be, but it'll probably it'll be early in the morning that I'll start doing um, by the end of the week, at least once a week, I'm going to start doing sessions at like probably 5 a.m. Um, Pacific Standard Time of discussing, you know, what the second hours are going to be and bringing them up to everybody to, to talk about. Um, so rather than just be me trying to figure it out, we'll all kind of brain, that brainstorming will happen all the time, but probably not in office hours itself. So stay tuned for that. We'll put that into the, uh, you'll see it kind of just hidden in the announcements <laughs> that are there like, oh, by the way, we're doing that here. So, um, and I'll let you know when that, when we start getting those scheduled. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks to the panelists for a lot of great answers. And um, we will see you in after hours tomorrow. Remember, Harrison Mixbus, you're going to want to see this. It's really cool. All right.